Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Michael. My pleasure. So this is going to be a very fun and exciting podcast. I think most of our listeners have read at least one of your books. But before we get into all that, I I do want to ask you, and this is a pretty open-ended question, if you could speak to any of the early experiences in your life that you believe kind of shaped you into who you are today. I was kind of a, a wandering soul. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And so in these various jobs, I learned some very important lessons that later became part of the 48 Laws which is basically you think that your talent, your goodness, your kindness, your hard work is enough in this world, but it isn't, right? Because naive people, I count myself among them, don't understand the power game, don't understand how they might be inadvertently making people feel insecure, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you're not adept at the social aspect of the work world, it's like you're you're putting yourself behind the eight ball. You're, you're you're kind of giving yourself a continual handicap. And I had many many experiences like that. You know, you know. I think of one experience where somebody um, I was a journalist living in New York back in the early '80s because I'm a relatively old guy, and um, I had done an article on Italy. It was like a travel article. The editor of the article took me to lunch one day, and he was drinking rather heavily at lunch. And then at one point he said, Robert, you're never going to be a writer. You don't have the talent. You're not disciplined enough. You're all over the place. You don't know how to communicate. I would suggest that you go to law school or business school, but this isn't for you, okay? That was kind of a turning point for me because it made me realize, A, I don't like working for other people because they, you know, pull that kind of crap on you. But B, I was in the wrong field. I was doing something from, I was writing for money in a profession that I didn't really respect. It wasn't a good fit. And so it kind of set me on this course where I was trying lots of all sorts of different things, writing novels, working in Hollywood. Somebody calling me out like that was actually a blessing in disguise. It's kind of similar to Ryan Holiday's the obstacle is the way. So looking at criticism, and I've gotten criticism before, particularly before I wrote my books, is actually a positive experience. You need these kind of moments where you're either failing or your feet are on the fire and people are telling you negative things. You need those moments to grow. And I had plenty of those moments until I wrote my book. It- you know, and, and to what you were just saying, I mean, how do you know when, when you're receiving criticism, whether that criticism is, is valid or, or perhaps that it's not? Because, you know, clearly your career as a writer turned out quite well. But I guess, how do you discern between, you know, the two types of feedback? Well, it's hard because initially when you get something like that, your emotions, your ego is all involved, right? But I like to look at it when people criticize you, there's always a germ of truth to it. Yes, there are people who feel envy and there might be a political purpose behind kind of making you feel bad, right? They envy you or et cetera, et cetera. But generally what this person was saying was actually true and right. I wasn't a good fit in journalism. And the thing is, initially I was very upset and it bothered me, but then slowly it dawned on me that he was right. If you look at it that way, you can learn from each of these kinds of incidents, because he was on to something, he understood. Now, of course, there are times where people are just trying to make you feel bad and you have to be able to distinguish that. But even when that happens, it's a lesson for you because it means you're able to distinguish people's true criticism. And you know when people are just being political and mean-spirited, right? Because the criticism doesn't hit at all. It has nothing to do with you. There's nothing in it that you can learn from. In this particular case, There was something I could learn from that I was not a good fit for me. But in any kind of situation like that, you have to learn to kind of drop your ego and listen and see if there might be some truth to what people are saying. And and if we fast forward a bit, and this is to 98 when uh, the 48 Laws of Power came out. and I'm just curious if when that book was about to come out, did you know were you looking at it and saying, hey, this is a pretty good book. I think this is going to be a hit. Because obviously now it's it's exploded. It's been you know over two decades. Everybody from prison inmates to movie stars, rappers, nonfiction authors. I mean, I, I think I saw even recently it's still in the top 10 best-selling books on Amazon overall. But 
how did you feel about it before you know before the book came out? Well, to, to be honest with you, I had success late in life. So when that book came out, I was 39 years old, which is a you know I'm a late bloomer if you want to be honest about it. So I had so many setbacks, so many failures, so many disappointments that I was quite realistic. And so I understood that this book would either be successful or it'd be an abysmal failure. And the reason I thought that, and I would kind of bounce back between the two, when I thought it'd be a great success, I imagined myself on all these talk shows and on the cover of magazines. The other side was, this copy will bomb, it'll be a disaster. And the reason I thought that is, it's a very strange book. I mean, I think you'll have to agree You've never physically seen a book that looks like it on the inside, the way it's structured, the different colors, the things on the margins, the stories that are being told. It was an incredible risk that I took in writing in that kind of particular format, which didn't really exist. There's really not a book that looks like that. In the back of my mind, the strangeness of the book was either going to make it incredibly successful or an incredible failure. And I tell people that, that it's better to fail being yourself and, and being bold and trying to chart new ground and kind of following what other people do and maybe having kind of mediocre success. Because I think the strangeness and weirdness of the book is contributed to it being becoming a kind of a cult classic. Yeah. What, what do you believe that was really kind of the allure of it? Just to see so many different, like just such a spectrum of, of readers just across, you know, really all aspects of society. Like what, what do you think was the allure of the book? It's kind of feeding a little bit into the dark side of human nature, which is quite repressed in our culture. You know, when it comes to a subject like power or the work world or offices or being a lawyer or whatever, we don't like to really talk about the truth. And when you see like a lot of self-help books out, out there, they all try to emphasize the goodness of human nature, how people are basically cooperative. You don't want to be manipulative. You don't want people to see you in this light, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't my experience in the work world. And I've had many, many different jobs. There are a lot of great people. I had great bosses, but 5 10% of them were grand manipulators and they made me suffer and I saw them punish a lot of other people. The lack of honesty in our culture was this book here was like a big splash of some really cold water in your face, right? It's like this is reality. This is what people are like. They manipulate. They conceal their intentions. They get other people to do the work and they take the credit. Nobody talks about that. It was like a dirty little secret. People talk about all of the in, ins and outs of their sex lives about money. But when it comes to that side of human nature, sh oh no, we don't want to talk about it. We're so embarrassed. And so the fact that I was so brutally upfront about this is how power operates in the world, I think is what made people kind of be attracted to it in a very powerful way. And so I think that's, that's part of the allure. And, and I'm, I'm curious that just going from a, a book like that that becomes a cult classic and then obviously you're continuing to write other books, right? Whether it's The Art of Seduction or even years later, The Laws of Human Nature. Just as a writer, does that carry a, a heavier weight on, on your shoulders now having had such a hit just to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a follow-up and a second and a third and a fourth and continue to do this. What's that like from a writing standpoint? Yeah, it adds pressure. But look at your the T-shirt that you're wearing. Yeah. Pressure is a good thing. When I came to my second book, I was very nervous because this first book was very successful. And the risk is the second book is a bomb. A lot of people have good first books and the second books don't really connect. It's a very common phenomenon. We see that in music with people who are one hit wonders, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was a good thing because basically it set up a pressure for me. Like here's a level that I have to continually reach. I can't let go, I can't relax, I can't rest on my laurels, on the good reviews, on the book sales. I have to reach and, and even make a better book the next time. So I'm someone who kind of feeds off, which is why I'm attracted to your t-shirt. I'm someone who kind of feeds off the pressure. It gives me energy, it makes me excited. And each time I write a book, I have the idea that I wanted this one to be the biggest seller of them all, you know. And so it makes me work extra hard. It makes me extra diligent and persistent. But I, I welcome that kind of privilege. I'm an extremely lucky man that I've had this sort of success. So I can't really complain about anything about it.
Speaking of pressure, I, I'm curious, what was your experience like working with 50 Cent and collaborating on the 50th Law? So him kind of being a rapper, kind of, I, I don't know if you'd ever had kind of worked with a rapper before, or how familiar you were with that scene and so on, but just what was it like writing a book together? Well, that wasn't pressure at all. That was that was a blast. That was probably the most fun I've had in my life when it comes to writing a book. Because, you know, mostly my books deal with dead people, historical figures. And I'm just sitting here in this office that you see me in writing my books. And here I got to meet and hang out with a, a real, what I call the Napoleon Bonaparte of hip hop. It was a privilege. It was so exciting for me. I'm not someone who's really into celebrity, into celebrity culture. What I'm into is kind of realness. People who have had really horrible experiences and have surmounted them. I have a tremendous respect for them, and I like the energy that I can pick up from them because I think they've overcome obstacles that I've never had to deal with. So 50 kind of embodies that. You can sort of see it. He has this incredibly calm energy. He's not what you think he is. He's not violent. He's not yelling. He's not out there at all. He's very calm, very soft-spoken. And that comes from all of the tough, horrible things he's been through. It also comes from having someone shoot him in the head and come this close to dying. And if you're that close to dying, you know nothing else really matters to you. So sort of his calmness, his fearlessness was extremely exciting for me to be around. I really like being around him. I learned a lot. And then writing the book, I got to hang out with him at a house that he bought from Mike Tyson in, in Connecticut, which is a very surreal place and very weird experience. I got to hang out with him on the streets of Southside Queens where he grew up and meet his friends and see kind of where he came from. I went to Vegas and the award ceremonies where I met all sorts of other rappers. I went to parties with him. I went to all sorts of events in New York. I followed him everywhere for six months. And, you know, as I said, it's, it's incredible memories. And I'm still dealing with him now because we're, we're going to be working together on some television projects. But he's wonderful, you know. He's surmounted of circumstances that normally crush most people. And trying to figure out why 50 became who he is was the challenge of writing this book, The 50th Law. And so um, there was no pressure. I mean, as I said, that was like the most fun experience I've had in actually writing a book. This has come up on on some past podcasts in, in this type of conversation in the sense of those who have gone through significant bouts of adversity and have kind of come out the other side and become very successful as a result. How much of this through your experience do you find is, is nature versus nurture, meaning that them being the way they are, they, you know, they would have navigated through that adversity versus, you know, the adversity shaped them? Well, it's a kind of question I can't really answer because it's one of those deep mysteries and scientists argue endlessly about it. I think it's a combination of both. So certainly when it comes to 50 or people like him who grew up in, in the hood or rappers who've surmounted that, there is something about him that's different. There is an energy. And I think the energy, if there is a genetic component, or I hate to say that, is his realistic outlook. He's not someone who uh, wants to get high all the time and just live a kind of in his fantasy world and imagine having money. He's extremely realistic when he looks at the world. And I think actually he got that from his mother, to be honest with you, because he had his mother was a drug dealer, um, a hustler who was killed, murdered when he was, I believe, nine years old. She had that kind of hardcore mentality. And I think he, he got that from her, whether that's nurture or nature, I don't know. But then, you know, he, he arrived at a key moment in his life after he got shot in the head. And he had already may had a record that he'd put together called Power of the Dollar. I think maybe his best record of all, incredible record. I think it was Columbia, the, the record label. And the second he got shot, they canceled the album. They withdrew it. It's never been, it's never been put out since, right? And that was a moment where most people would be crushed. My career's over, my music career's over. There are no avenues for me, right? What am I going to do? If a record label won't pick up that album, all of the record labels are going to blacklist me. In that turning point, he became extremely angry and energized, and he decided he was going to prove them wrong. He was going to make them eat dust, as I like to say. And what he did was he went on this insane 
mixtape campaign where he went directly to the people. He brought his music directly to them. It was so hard hitting that people really, really loved it. It was such a phenomenal success that Eminem heard the music and go, we got to sign this guy here. Let's get him over to Interscope. But that turning point, which we talk about in the book called Turning Shit Into Sugar, where you take the worst circumstance and you make it an opportunity. How many people would ever think of that? Because being shot gave him realness as opposed to all the fake gangster rappers out there you know, who pretended to be real gangsters when they weren't. This gave him realness and authenticity. So he saw it as an opportunity. I don't know where that comes from, to be honest with you. It's a sort of a mindset, which I think is kind of a hardcore realistic mindset. That's what makes him different. One of the themes in many of your books uh, seems to be persuasion. And, And I'm curious, what does a person need to know in order to be better at persuasion? The way to be better at persuasion is to completely alter how you think about it to do a a complete mind reversal and go, the key to persuasion is not about yourself. It's not about your brilliant ideas. It's not about your ego. It's not about, you know, how you can craft this great message for another person or whatever it is and the product you're trying to market. It's in thinking very deeply about other people. That is the key to, to persuasion. And if you learn that one key, If you develop it and you use it, then the world will open up to you. But it's not so easy because we're all self-absorbed, as I say, in the laws of human nature. We have this kind of centripetal force about us where we're always sort of self-absorbed and thinking about our interests, how great we are, what we can do for other people. You need to flip that around and you need to be so focused on other people. And that means you have to listen to them to a different degree. You have to get inside their spirit, their mindset, what they're missing in this world. You have to enter their spirit, which is one of the chapters in the art of seduction. You have to understand what their hurts were, what what has wounded them in the past, and what they need and what they're missing. And if you can get outside of yourself and truly listen to people, and the main thing is that I talk about in human nature is, you have to see that is incredibly exciting. People are interesting. They're more interesting than you think they are, right? And so they have stories to tell. And so that energy that you have, where you're focused on them, you're getting inside their mind, people pick that up, first of all, and it's very seductive and very powerful. But it gives you the kind of information and the kind of ideas that will end up making them resist you less and less and less. So just get out of yourself and stop thinking about how brilliant you are, about how great your ideas are, and just get inside the people you're trying to persuade. What's kind of the line between persuasion and, and manipulation? Is it really come down to the, the intent behind it, or, is, or do you find there's some different reasoning behind it? Back in the days when I wrote The 48 Laws of Power, it was my belief that it doesn't really matter. So every kind of form of persuasion is, in essence, a sort of a manipulation, right? Because if you went out there in the social world or or in a case of law where you're trying to argue a particular case and you just said what you wanted to say, if you just expressed your feelings, it wouldn't have any effect, right? But you learn, oh, no, I've got to craft my message. I have to be strategic with it, right? I have to, or tactical. I think it's more strategic than tactical. I have to learn how to craft my message, what my audience wants to hear, Okay, well, that's a manipulation. Let's just call it what it is. Sometimes the acts of persuasion are for dark and evil purposes. That's for sure. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're for good purposes. Maybe you have a great book you're trying to sell people or a product. And so your marketing scheme is a manipulation, but it's for good in the end, etc. Even Mahatma Gandhi was a manipulator in his ways of using the English press to gain sympathy for the cause of India, East India, and for their independence. So get over this idea that there's some kind of purity in this world, that I can be a pure person, that I I can persuade without ever having to be manipulative, because that's wrong. It's the nature of the game. As we're talking about, I guess, mastering social intelligence, a lot of what's shared in the laws of human nature. I think if the reader is a politician or a public figure and they're reading about the importance of mastering social intelligence, they say, okay, I understand the utility of this right out of the gate. But what about everybody else, right? 
business leaders, parents, and so on. I have a hard time understanding why anybody would think that. We're a social animal. If you understand anything about evolution and about where we came from, we are the premier social animal on the planet, although some people consider ants to be the premier social animal, but we're high among them, right? Everything we do is social. You're not really an individual. You, Michael Mogul, are not really Michael Mogul. You're a conglomerate of your parents, of their ideas, of their genetics. You're, all of your thoughts come from language, which come from English, which comes from Old English, which comes from Latin, back, back, back. You are a mix of history, right? You are not an individual. You're a social being. So nobody can gain power in this world or be successful or gain anything that they want without understanding the social game. Just take being a parent, for instance. You have a three-year-old, okay? You know how children can be extremely difficult to manage. They haven't been socialized yet. They have their wants, their needs, their desires. They're very powerful. They're very willful. And I hate to say it, they can be manipulative. They know how to pour on the sweetness when they want something, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, if you're a parent, you have to understand their psychology, their mindset, how different it is from yours in order to be able to get them to stop some of the behavior that you don't like and to become more of what you want them to become, or just to even accept them as they are. But you have to be very subtle with your psychology. So if you're a parent that doesn't even want to think about that, you're going to have problems, I, I believe. If you're a business person and you're not out or direct, you're not thinking about people, you won't know how to connect to an audience. You won't know how, how to create a product that will have mass appeal. Okay? I mean, even athletes... And I've consulted with some very successful athletes where it seems to be all about the individual, you know, NBA players, etc. They have to deal with the social dynamic on a very powerful front. Here are 14, 15 men or women in a very competitive environment, you know, where everyone has their ego. You've got the coach. You've got all these pressures on you. You have to be a master at the social game. You have to understand how to get along with others, how to get along with your coach, etc., there's not a human being on the planet that doesn't need this kind of information, I'm sorry to say. And, and I want to elaborate on this, on what, what you mentioned, because I've heard you share this in an interview before where, you know, while many of us may feel like we have an idea of our identities and how we define ourselves, I, I've heard you argue that, you know, we actually have no idea who we are. I meditate every, every morning. I was meditating and I had this weird thought come up to me and it was, I don't really know who I am. And so I think... I'm motivated by this idea, but what if I'm completely wrong? What if I, it comes from something I've never even imagined before? And then I thought, I have a memory of something that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. What if that memory is completely false, that actually there was something very different going on at the time? And I had this image of this kind of fuzzy, fuzzy image of, 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 a, of something happening in the past, and that that's what my memory is, that the reality that's focused, I have no idea what it is, okay? So most of the things that you do in life, you really don't have access to where they come from. I'm writing about this right now. I'm writing about the brain and how it operates. And most of it is automatic, okay? Your thoughts, if you ever spend time meditating, you see thoughts just coming up out of nowhere. You have no control over them. 98% of your thoughts, you do not will them. They simply come to you. Your emotions, they're physical things that are going on in your brain. Certain hormones are being released. They enter your bloodstream and they cause a reaction. And then you think about them and they become an emotion. You have no idea where they come from. You don't know why you're angry. You don't know why you're depressed. You don't really know why you're frustrated. You might have a clue. You might have an, a vague idea. But I think it's important to have some humility when it comes to yourself and to realize that you are kind of a mystery. And so when people used to enter the temple of Delphi in ancient Greeks, the Oracle of Delphi, which was the, considered the seat of all wisdom, what was inscribed on top was know thyself, which was the highest form of wisdom. In order to know who you are, you have to begin from the idea, which comes from Socrates, that you don't know who you are, that you are ignorant. Ignorance is the source of knowledge. By admitting to yourself you know nothing, now you can begin to learn. 
And so if you think you know who you are, you're so clear about your identity, that's a sure sign that you're fooling yourself, that you're believing the script you want to believe in, and that you haven't spent the time to actually investigate and introspect on your true nature. It's a bit frightening in the sense of, I'm a stranger to myself, I don't really myself, but it's also very exciting because it means you haven't figured it out yet and maybe there's still room for you to change and you can become someone else, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably the most important process you can go through is that kind of introspective process. And, and, and Robert, to elaborate on that, how do you recommend somebody go through that introspective process? I know you, you've referenced meditation, which um, I also do, but uh, you know, anything else that someone who's listening to this can do that would be actionable for them? It's a mindset. It's not a particular activity that you can do. It's how you think about the world in general, right? So what gets in the way of true introspection is your ego and your insecurities. And that what that has is you hit a wall that says, I don't want to go there, Michael. I don't want to go there, Robert, because I might discover things that are painful about myself, truths about myself. So it's better that I just believe this myth that I've created that everything I do is for goodness and for good intentions, that I'm actually brilliant and great at what I do, that I'm rational, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in order to be truly introspective, you have to be willing to have some pain and to be honest with yourself and to get rid of your ego and to look at yourself as if you're looking at someone else, right, with an honest approach. But if you're riddled with insecurities, if you find that frightening, if you prefer to have the illusion, no activity, even meditation, won't do any good. And the whole point of meditation is to help you get rid of that ego and that voice inside of your head. But to me, that's the most important thing, is to kind of drop your insecurities and say, I want to be reasonable, I want to be rational with who I am. I want to understand who I am, because if I do, I will have much more success and much more happiness in life. And I'm motivated to do that, even if it's painful. And I can tell you writing the laws of human nature was a painful experience because 18 of the chapters deal with kind of negative qualities. And as I'm writing the book, I'm going, wow, Robert, you are irrational. You are quite a narcissist. You are very short sighted. You have a dark side. You feel envy. You can't be grandiose. You're aggressive on and on and on. But you can only change who you are if you're honest about who you are, right? So that's, to me, the, the flip you have to go in and kind of drop your ego and your selfishness. And, and I've heard you, you mention with respect to the laws of human nature that, you know, the book was five to six years in the making, but really more like closer to 60 years in the making. Unfortunately, giving away my age, it was, yeah, probably when I was two years old, I was gathering up information and research for the book that I would write as I observed my parents in my crib. It is, was 60 years in the making, for sure. All of my schooling, all of my years in, in public education, all of the different jobs I've had. And then certainly the consulting that I've done in the last 20 years with some people who are celebrities, some people who aren't, but seeing the kind of pain that a lot of people are in, also the emails I get, that people are in a lot of pain and they don't really know the source of their pain. They tend to blame themselves and they don't realize that the source of their pain is they don't understand people, they don't understand their intentions, they don't understand their thoughts, and they do things that have unintended consequences and it creates all this drama and it's very, very painful. And so seeing that in people who I who were very successful, who came to me for ideas, taught me an incredible amount about this weakness that we all have. Yeah. And, and Robert, I have to say, I was going to ask you this question, but I've actually noticed you've already done it even during this podcast. So even throughout your books, it seems like the approach that you take is, is oftentimes referencing either historical stories or even grit. Greek mythology to illustrate points versus personal experiences or, you know, or, or, or some sort of research study or something like that. Why do you take the approach that you do? We're talking about persuasion. A book is an attempt at persuasion. Otherwise, why are you writing a book, right? You want people to like your ideas and to absorb them in some way, okay? And in order to persuade my readers, I have to be seductive. I have to know the art of persuasion. Okay, well, what is one of the most powerful forms of persuasion going back to when you were a child? 
It's telling a story. But the moment you start telling a story, you say, once upon a time, there was this prince, blah, 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 blah. You're entranced. You want to hear it. You want to know what comes next. You're, you're, you stop being defensive. You stop feeling insecure. It's not somebody here who's like trying to bowl you over with their knowledge and make you feel like you're inferior to them. They're inviting you into a story that has to do with something that will probably relate to your life. So if I began my books with studies, you know, in 2003, preacher scientists in Denmark discovered that power and manipulation and, you know, and all these numbers, etc., readers would be closing the book in mass. I would never sell a single copy, right? And besides which, I find those studies often quite ridiculous. They come out and they prove something that everybody knows is self-evident, you know, like reading enriches your mind. Wow, you need to do a study to do that? Okay, great. My eyes start going like this, and I don't get very far in the book. Telling a story has a different effect. And if I told stories about myself, how self-indulgent, how boring, how uninteresting, who am I? I'm trying to tell you about power. And here, a little measly Robert Greene, 38 years old, who's never had power. He's telling about his experiences working in some office. How stupid. No, he's writing about Louis XIV. Well, that man really had power. That's somebody I really could listen to. It's also appealing a bit, to, I hate to say, to people's narcissism as well, because when you put yourself in this story, you're putting yourself in the shoes of a king or a general or a queen or some emperor, you know, or Cesare Borgia or Machiavelli. And it, and it makes you feel like, wow, I'm on this level of history. I'm part of this history. It's kind of a, a, an older way of looking at writing a book, I must admit, because nowadays most people don't like to do that. Um, and that's where the 48 Laws of Power, which started this whole thing for me, was a bit of a risk because I wasn't talking about that study in Denmark. I wasn't talking about some scientist who came up with this theory. I wasn't talking about myself. The lesson I learned is people love this. They love learning about history. History is so exciting. There's so many lessons to me. And we've been taught history in this really boring way, as if it's just an accumulation of facts. Instead, it's human beings in real life situations, just like you are right now. You know, never outshine the master, law number one. A man tries to throw a party that's going to impress the king and get him to elevate him into a higher position. And the party is so successful that everyone is praising the man and not the king. And the next day after this amazing party, probably the greatest party ever thrown in the history of mankind, he's thrown into prison for the rest of his life because he made the king feel insecure. Well, that's happening with you and your boss. You're trying so hard to impress him or her that you're making them feel insecure. You're not thrown into prison for the rest of your life. You're fired. Okay. And so... With that kind of larger metaphor, I think people find it incredibly seductive, right? And it's easier to learn a lesson from that. And and Robert, I don't I don't have a good segue for this question because it's completely off topic from what we've been discussing. But I've just noticed that it's this is something that's come up in a, in a number of podcasts, and we've talked about longevity and just human performance optimization, and this idea that with where science is headed, that you know we will live longer, and then potentially one day, perhaps even have the option of living forever. And and I know you discussed the, in, in your book, you know, uh, Memento Mori, this idea that you know remembering that you have to die. What do you think are the implications of just longevity? And, and and really what's happening in society and, and the fact that, I mean, is it is living longer or potentially living forever, is that a good thing? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. As the great Jim Morrison said, no one here gets out alive. And that's the case, right? You have to face your mortality. I want to be healthy. I'd like to live until I'm 100. My mother is 95 years old and she's doing very well. God bless her, etc. So we all want that desire. For me to deny that we don't want to be healthy and live longer lives is ridiculous. Okay? But first of all, the planet could not sustain people living forever, right? We're having a hard enough time with 7 billion people, whatever it's gone up to nowadays. Imagine if people don't die, and then how are young people ever going to get jobs? All the old people will have all the power and control, etc., etc. It's extremely unhealthy, and it's extremely stupid. 
Death is a part of life. It's a good part of life. If you deny death, you're denying life itself. The two go hand in hand together. Old people have to get off the stage and let young people rule this world and give them the space to do their thing and stop crowding it off with all their boomer ideas, etc. But if boomers lived forever, what a nightmare. What an incredible nightmare. The great Jonathan Swift, the English writer, wrote a story about a man who lived until he was 900-something, and he was the most miserable person on the planet because all of his friends had died. There was nobody left of his family. He looked around a world where nobody was like him, had no, none of the memories, etc. And he decided, I'm just going to kill myself. I can't take it any longer. I'm so lonely, etc. You know, I could sing you a song that goes into the same thing, but I'm, I'm a terrible singer, so I won't do that. It's from the song, It Ain't Necessarily So, about Methuselah, who lives 900 years. And, it, and the gist of it is, what woman is going to be interested in a man who's 900 years old, right? And so what's the point of living if you can't interest a woman in you? So, you know, that's my take on, on living forever. Look, I, I agree. I agree. And I think if, if you knew you had an infinite time horizon, what would, what would be the driver behind not just getting out of bed in the morning, but just the agency to do anything? Yeah. So... Yeah, death ground strategy. Death is on your heels. You better energize. You better get going. You better. You only have so much time to accomplish things, right? It also, it makes you appreciate life. I I personally came very close to dying myself. I had a stroke. Very lucky that I'm alive right now. Okay, but knowing that I could have died or that it's it's haunting me every hunting me every moment of the day. When I look out the window here in Los Angeles and I see the blue sky. And I see the ivy on the wall, and I see the birds, and I hear things. I'm so grateful. But if you're going to live forever, you don't care anymore. Why? You don't have that sense of the evanescence of life, which is the beauty of life. And that's an incredible part of Zen Buddhism and Japanese culture, is the ephemerality of all things is what makes them beautiful, right? If the cherry blossoms blossomed every day of the year, you would never appreciate it. Because they disappear, they have beauty. So that's another way of looking at it. And Robert, how do you how do you define success? You know, I kind of wrote the answer to that in mastery. And essentially what I'm trying to say in that book is you were born as an individual. You're unique. There's something unique about you, right? Now, I know I'm kind of contradicting something I said earlier, which is fine because I'm always contradicting myself. But I said earlier that you're not really an individual. But there is some, another way of looking at it. Your DNA for Michael Mogul has never existed in the past. There will never be another person with your DNA. There will never be another Michael Mogul who had the parents that he has and their experiences and your life experiences and the people you've met. You are one of a kind, right? And so success is leaning into that, understanding it, appreciating it, and loving it, and finding out what makes you different and using that to make you stand out in your career, in your work, in your personal life and not being afraid of it. And the problem that humans have is we're such conformists. We want to be like everyone else. We want to follow what other people are doing. We're afraid of standing out. We're afraid of being different. But your difference is what is your strength. So success, to me, doesn't mean you have to be Elon Musk. You can be a carpenter replacing the floors in my kitchen, which is happening right now as I speak. But you're very good at that, and it's something that's, that you love doing, and you love working with your hands, and it's part of your destiny. It's what I call your life's task. If you realize your life's task, if you realize what you love and what energizes you, what you were meant to accomplish, it doesn't matter the money. That, to me, is true success, right? And what ends up happening is, People who do find their way into that path usually do quite well for themselves. You know, they make more than enough money, et cetera, and they're happy in their careers. I hate to say this because it's a law attorney podcast, but a lot of people back when I was growing up, I don't know if it's the same way now, were kind of pressured into going into law because it's lucrative and no one could deny that it's, it's a good way to make money, right? But it didn't connect to a lot of people. I was pressured to go to law school, etc. Some people, it's a great connection, but some people, it isn't. And so you could end up being a very powerful, high-powered attorney, 
But when you're in your 40s and 50s and you realize this isn't what I wanted to do and I didn't connect with me, to me, that isn't real success. And, and you're going to pay a price for that eventually, I think. Should I not have said that about attorneys? Look, I, I'll tell you what, we don't, we don't have any ads or sponsors on this podcast. So you could say whatever you want. I almost went to law school and I think I could have been a really good lawyer because there are elements of it that fascinate me. The element of argument, of winning a case, I'm very competitive, et cetera, et cetera, and very strategic. So don't get me wrong, I'm not putting it down at all. It's just that for some people, it's the wrong choice. Well, to, to your point earlier, I think know thyself. I, I had a chapter in my life, you know, being the son of two immigrant parents where my path was, was medical school. And I went all the way actually to getting accepted in medical school before I decided it was not for me. And I, I always think about like, what would have happened had I gone? It's a different life path, right? Perhaps a lifetime of, of dissatisfaction, maybe. I don't know. But the interesting thing is, Michael, is that you didn't do it. There was something inside of you it said, this is the wrong path for me to take, right? And what interests me was that little voice inside of you that averted you away from that path in life that would have led to something. And that's what interests me. Some people have that voice in them, and that's what saves them. And the sad thing is some people don't seem to have that voice, and they come to me saying, Robert, I don't really know what I'm meant to do. Can you help me? But you had it, which is very important. And I think about it a lot. And I don't know quite what it is, whether some people call it luck or something else, because the alternative for me at the time was not a good alternative. It was either medical school or, this is in 2008, recession hits. I'm working in, like, in a dive bar, making minimum wage. I mean, this was not you know, a, a great alternative that I chose at the time, at least. You worked in a bar? I was a waiter, yes. That's fine. You know, I, I think that's the great path for people to take, because so many times... Young people make a mistake thinking that they've got to make money. They're in a hurry to have success in their career. And when you're young, you want to have adventures. You want to learn. And waiting on tables or being a bartender teaches you an awful lot about people, about human nature. You don't want to be that for more than a year because it sucks. Yeah. I've been a waiter myself. I know how it sucks. But, man, I learned so much waiting tables about people, et cetera. Then if I had gone to law school and just settled into a law career, I learned much more about people and, and was able then to write books about it. So having adventures and trying different things is actually a blessing in disguise. And, and, and Robert, I'm curious. So I, I know you mentor quite, quite a few people. I mean, Ryan Holiday has been on the podcast. He mentioned that you were a mentor of his. From your perspective, what's been the best advice that you've received and perhaps the worst advice? I've been asked this before, and I kind of tend to um, refer to my wife. I was really unhappy. I was working in Hollywood. I was working for a television show in particular, and I was making decent money. But man, was I miserable right? I was trying to write screenplays because I thought this was my goal in life was to become a screenwriter. And I wrote screenplays that I thought were going to be, you know, kind of, that could sell because I wanted to get out of this racket I was in and make a lot of money and get out of it. And it wasn't clicking. It wasn't working. And she said, Robert, you have to make a choice. You either have to do what you want in life or you have to give that up and just try and make money. But you can't have it both ways, right? So you want to be a writer. You want to write books. At the time, I wanted to write plays and novels. Do that, and then maybe the money will come. Or give that up, and then just go make a whole lot of money and don't worry about it. But don't try and have it both ways. And I know that's kind of particular to my circumstances, but I think it, it has application to other people. So sometimes... When you pursue something so single-mindedly, it's exactly what you're not going to get. There's a perverse law of human nature. I talk about it in the laws of human nature. You, your desire is so focused on one thing, it's continually eluding your grasp. But when you let go and you try something else, it will come to you. You know, Steve Jobs, who ended up being one of the wealthiest people ever on the, in history, he never wanted to make money. He was never really interested in making money. He was interested in creating products and designing the perfect thing, right? And then the money came to him. So if you do what you love, and I know people talk about it, it can be kind of a cliche, and we do have to be practical in this life. You can't just start playing the guitar in subways of New York because you love it. You know, you're not going to make any money. You have to be practical. 
But to the degree that your career connects with you, the money will come. So that was the best advice. And the the flip from that was like my parents trying to tell me that I had to settle for these jobs and just stick with them. My, My whole life trajectory is I couldn't stick with one thing. Every nine months, I was changing jobs. I've never my whole life had a job for more than 11 months. I counted once. I was just moving around, moving and moving, moving around. And they were trying to say, no, you've got to settle down, Robert. You've got to choose something and take it. I probably would be dead right now. I probably would have committed suicide if I had stuck with any of those horrible jobs I've had. You know, I've done construction work. I worked in a detective agency. I worked for a library creating the first digital encyclopedia. The most boring, mind-numbing jobs you can imagine. If I had stuck with them, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I'd be alive. So that's kind of my, the advice that I think was, was the most appropriate for me. And, and as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, Robert, what does being a game changer mean to you? There's so many people out there who are doing the same thing, right? And so if you're at a job and you're 26, 27 years old, and you're kind of in this comfortable position, don't be so comfortable because what will happen in two or three years is you're getting older, you're becoming more expensive, you'll be fired, and somebody younger will replace you. You are replaceable. Game changer is somebody who's not replaceable. There is only one Michael Mogul. Nobody could take over the Game Changing Attorney podcast because you're the only person who could do it. That is a game changer to me because there's so, it's so easy to get rid of people, to replace them with someone else who can do the same thing for less money, etc. But if you have a skill, if you have an ability that no one else can do, you own the world. The world is your empire. You have it, you have it all. Too many people try to do what other people are doing, they follow the trend, and then they don't stand out, and then they're replaced by 20 other people on social media, other influencers who can do and say the same thing. They're getting older, they're not so hip anymore. But if you know who you are, if you're solid, you, you know that it's okay to be weird and different and create something that stands out, then you're not so replaceable. To me, that's, that's how I see the word, or that's what a game changer is for me.